Wonderful. Can you see my screen? Perfect. Yeah, great. All right, see you in a bit. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Well, um, it's a pleasure to be here. First of all, thank you for inviting me to take part. And thank you for volunteering me to go first. It's a privilege. Um, so my name is Nathan. Um, I work as a journal specialist for the Frontiers in Plant Science Journal. Um, what that means is that my main role is in the development of the journal, whether it's building our editorial boards, maintaining them, um, and also ensuring that um, our editors can develop new areas to highlight within the, within the journal. Um, and this is primarily through research topic collections, which I'll mention later on as well. So, a bit, uh, oh, if it changes slide. Okay, great. A little bit about who we are. So Frontiers in Plant Science is part of the Frontiers Publishing Group. And this has quickly become the one of the largest um, publishing groups there is. But more importantly, it's one of the largest open science publishers. So Frontiers is really on a mission to make all science open. And this is because we want to help this transition from traditional publishing to open access publishing. And one of the reasons for that is because we really feel that um, open access publishing is the way to accelerate scientific and technical innovation. And this leads to scientific social, societal progress, economic growth, but really it leads to living healthier lives on a healthy planet. So as I mentioned, Frontiers has grown very rapidly. It started about 13 years ago from a few neuroscience journals and now covers over 90 different journals um, we have a cumulative total of well over 190,000 published articles now. So this is really staggering growth. And this is so important for Frontiers as a publisher because it means that we're all these 190,000 uh, published articles are now in the open domain. Anybody can access them who's got an internet connection. This is really putting out research and knowledge into the hands of everybody. So it's something that we're very proud of and something that we don't want to hide behind because we're really on a, we're very striving there to become one of the largest publishers there is. Um, I'm gonna mention a little bit about Plan S right at the beginning. Um, I'm sure we'll discuss it a little bit later, um, but from the beginning, Frontiers has been a fully Plan S compliant journal. Um, there are 10 key requirements to being fully compliant, and, but I'm just gonna mention a few of them for now. So first of all, the Plan S means that the authors of the publications retain the copyright. So this means, for example, there's no embargo period. Um, it means that your research and your publications are really yours. You can use the images in your presentations. You can um, use them what, for however um, way you like, as long as you cite us correctly. And that's one of the probably the most fundamental uh, requirements of the Plan S movement. Secondly, um, and this is something that I really wanted to highlight, is that in this transition to open access publishing, we really need the scientific community, community to be on board. And so this means having the scientific community trust the publishers. So we really want to get away from those hidden deals between publishers and, and, the, uh, and institutions and ensure that the transparency is there for everybody to see. There's nobody is going to be on board with open access publishing if they don't have the faith and confidence in it. So for example, with Frontiers, you can see exactly where all of your the APC costs go in terms of developing new journals, um, supporting research from areas of the world without too much research funding. So I'd really encourage you to look into that and ensure that where you're publishing, um, there's this transparency to the costs associated. And then finally, well, something that often gets overlooked is that there should be this, um, for funders who participate in the planners movement, there is the requirement that impact factor is not considered um, when funding is provided to researchers. And this is something that at Frontiers and Plant Science, we're very keen on because it means that we have given, we can now give you the tools to understand the true impact. Can you still see my screen? Oh, it's just disappeared for me. <laughs> yeah, I can still see it. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry about that. Um, 
sorry, I'll carry on. Um, we give you the, the ability to understand the true impact of your work, not just the impact factor of the publisher or the journal, but you can understand where, who it is in the world who is reading your work, which publications are highlighting your work, which articles um, are mentioning your research. So Frontiers in Plant Science specifically, um, we're the largest publisher of plant science research by quite a considerable way. Um, we're publishing by far the most articles in the plant science field. And obviously with that scale also comes citations, but those citations match the number of articles that we're publishing. So this results in an average impact factor of 4.4 for the journal. And apart from these average uh, metrics, the sheer number of citations demonstrates the influence that our journal at Frontiers in Plant Science is having on the overall plant science community. And that's something that we're very pleased and privileged to be in that position. Um, one thing that might be different to many other plant science publishers is that we focus on the validity of the results and not so much on the perceived impact of the research during the peer review process. So one of the strict criteria for criteria that you do not reject for is based on the perceived impact of the manuscript. And so there's plenty of good research in the past, which has been rejected based on this idea of perceived impact. Um, but Frontiers and Plant Science, if your research is valid and scientifically sound and passes through our rigorous peer review, we will be more than happy to publish it. But this isn't to say that our articles are not of high quality we apply very stringent rejection criteria. And this is because we have a, we split our journal up into a number of different sections. There's a very strong independent editorial board who has the oversight to um, uh, ensure that there are the certain requirements required for each public, each manuscript which is published. A little bit about um, this editorial board that I just mentioned. We are a very community led journal. So leading us at the moment is Yundi Zhao. He's recently taken over as our chief editor of the entire journal. He also oversees the plant physiology section of our journal. And with him, there are 20 other specialty chief editors, each with their own special section, whether it's uh, crop and product physiology or um, plant abiotic stress, they all ensure that their specific sections have their own criteria for each manuscript which is submitted. Now, alongside these, we also have a number of guest associate editors. Now, we love our guest associate editors because they come on, on board with us temporarily, and they often come on board to highlight what their work in so-called research topics. So research topics are article collections with frontiers in plant science, which really, at that moment, highlight the current research which is taking place. So, we reach out to editors who would like to develop one of these collections and it gives them the opportunity to bring together a series of manuscripts, um, have editorial oversight of them and really bring together the scientific community around their particular topic at that moment in time. And then finally, being a community led journal, it wouldn't be possible without the tools that we've developed. So we understand that academic researchers have more than enough on their plates. And we really want to ensure that if we are community led, that we give those tools to the researchers. So this means we have developed the technological tools such as our artificial intelligence review assistant, which helps to identify problems in the manuscripts such as plagiarism, image manipulation, et cetera. While also meaning that they can very quickly move between manuscripts, they can quickly respond to reviewers comments as an author. Um, any of the editors and the chief editors can go into any part of the process to really have full oversight of the processes and do it as easily as possible. So that's something that we're very proud of at Frontiers is the technological tools that we've developed. And it's one of the, the best feedback we get from authors is how easy it is to work with us. And then finally, um, please do get in touch. It's been a very quick uh, presentation, but we're a friendly group. So if you have any questions um, or inquiries, please reach out to us. Um, team of journal specialists is led by Ludmila, my manager. 
Um, and really this year, we're focused on developing our editorial board for one. So if you're interested in reviewing for us or you're interested in editing manuscripts for us, please let us know. We'd be happy to discuss this with you and um, discuss the roles that are involved. And then secondly, research topics. We're always on the lookout for which areas of research to highlight with our platform and we'll be very happy to support you in any way you want. And I look forward to hearing from you. So I think um, with that, that's the end of the presentation. So thank you very much for listening. Thanks so much, Nathan. So um, we're going to come back later. Um, everyone will be able to field the questions. So please think about questions you want. More kind of more general questions that you'd like to ask, not like, you know, what happened to my manuscript that I submitted to Frontiers three weeks ago. Um, so if you have general questions um, for all of our presenters, um, please come back later on. So so next up is going to be Sarah, who's going to present now. So let me make her the presenter. Thanks, Nathan. We'll see you a bit later. Great. Can you can you see the screen okay now? Yeah, it looks good. Okay. Okay. So um yeah, th thanks very much for um inviting me to participate today. It's a pleasure to be involved. Um I'm Sarah Lennon, the executive editor at the New Phytologist Foundation. Um my details there in the um New Phytologist Foundation website if you're interested in finding a little bit more. Um Oh, oh, sorry. Um, so the New Phytologist Foundation is an independent, not-for-profit organisation that is dedicated to the promotion of plant science. Some of you may know us as the New Phytologist Trust. We changed the name last year. Um, the reason for this was to give, we felt foundation would give greater prominence to um, the not-for-profit charitable aspects of the organisation and it was more widely understood um, globally, as we are, um, we're based in the UK, but we're an international organisation. Um, one of the main activity of the New Phytologist Foundation is the publication of the journals um, New Phytologist and Plants People Planet. Um, New Phytologist, hopefully, will be familiar with. It's um, founded in 1902. It's a broad spectrum plant science journal. Plants People Planet, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about New Phytologist um, in the next slide. Plants People Planet is um, the latest journal, the newest journal from New Phytologist Foundation. And again, that's quite broad focused um, plant um, journal, but we focus on plant related research, not strictly plant science. So it's interdisciplinary um, and covers all aspects of plant focused research that's of relevance to plants, people and the planet. Um, we also undertake a lot of community activities. The New Phytologist Workshop and Symposia Series being two examples of that. Um, obviously, due to the pandemic, we haven't been able to take forward our symposium workshop series in the way that we normally would. So we paused our symposia um, activities for the moment. We had um, three symposia planned for last year. Um, we hope to resume them when it's safe to to do so. Um, and there should be some um, activities on the in the online area before too long. And there has been some activities in the workshop um, area online so far, but. Um, these um, activities haven't, haven't been taken forward in the way that we, we would we hope to had COVID-19 not happened. Um, one of the activities that we are really keen to, to highlight is the New Phytologist Next Generation Scientist Workshop. And this is a series of symposia, um, symposia not workshops, symposia, um, that's dedicated to early career scientists. And these um, meetings, we aimed to run them once a year. Obviously, last year we were due to have a meeting in, in Estonia. We had to postpone. Um, but these are annual events and they are dedicated to early career scientists. They are fully funded by the New Phytologist Foundation and they um, offer the chance for early career scientists to get together, listen to talks, um, enjoy a poster session, social events um, and some training um, activities and um, information sessions um, and they really are one of the key um, activities of our year. Uh, the New Phytologist Foundation also is involved in um, awarding grants and um, prizes, one of the most notable of which is the Tansley Medal um, Prize, which I'll mention a little bit um, further down the line. Um, 
I'll talk a little bit about new phytologist um, in, in more detail. So new phytologist considers work that addresses fundamental questions across the broad spectrum of plant science. Um, we have broad expertise in the editorial board, um, and if you're keen to submit a paper to new phytologist, we're always happy to receive pre-submission inquiries. So please do just drop us a note and we can help you. Um, we also publish a lot, a lot of papers as well. So in 2020, we published over 700 articles um, across 24 issues of the journal. And of those 700, quite a lot of those um, papers, over 30% were actually made free to access uh, immediately on publication by the New Vitologist Foundation. And this includes our key um, Tansley reviews, um, series, Tansley Insight, and um, all of our forum content, which is letters, viewpoints, um, and commentaries. Um, and we make this material freely available to ensure that it can be as widely disseminated as possible. In addition to the articles that are made freely available by the, the Foundation, authors also have the option to publish their work as open access articles. We work with Wiley to publish the journal, um, but we are a completely independent organisation and all editorial aspects are um, undertaken independently. Um, Wiley have a number of agree agreements with funders throughout the world, which can allow authors to make their articles freely available as through um, open access. Um, and if you're interested and you want to find out more about that, there's more information on our website. And again, you can also drop us a, an email. We can help you figure out the best route for you to publish your work open access. Um, because we are an independent organisation and we are not for profit, we can um, ensure that our authors retain corporate to their work and also our license terms for authors who choose not to publish under an open access license are fully compatible with Plan S and with Coalition S funder mandates. So again, this is something that a lot of authors are concerned about at the moment. So if you have any questions about that, you're more than welcome to, to contact us. Um, there are no page charges or publication fees unless you choose to, to publish um, open access. And we also aim to make all content freely available to readers 12 months after publication of an issue. Again, this is part of our um, activities to ensure that con content in the journal is as freely, freely available as possible um, and as quickly as possible. Uh, I mentioned earlier the Uvitologist Tansley Meadow. Um, this is actually um, open at the moment. The 2021 competition is, um, is running at the moment and the deadline for applications for that is the 29th of January. And this is awarded in recognition of outstanding contribution to research in plant sciences. And um, there's the six individuals that you can see um, on that slide are all recent winners and their work covers the, the, the broad spectrum of plant sciences. It's open to anyone who's within five years of defending their PhD. And if you've had any career breaks, that doesn't count towards that, that five year period. Again, if you have any questions, you can you can contact me and I, I can um, I can advise. Um, the winner of the Tansley Medal receives two thousand pounds um, prize money, and they also author a Tansley Insight article that's published in the journal alongside the the insights of their their fellow finalists. And if you're interested in applying, I do encourage you to to consider it. Um, so it's, it's a great competition, and um, the work that the the winners and the finalists produce is always um, worth worthy of reading. Um, I'll also talk briefly about Plants People Planet, which, as I mentioned, is the, the, the most recent journal from the New Phytologist Foundation. Um, we launched it in 2019, and we've now published two volumes of the journal. Um, Plants People Planet considers interdisciplinary plant-focused research that's a wide relevance to people, society, and, and the planet. Um, we have an interdisciplinary editorial board, so as well as plant scientists, we have social scientists and people who, um, who work in the arts and humanities, and we aim to really capture that, that broad plant-focused research. This journal is fully open access, so um, authors can, can publish um, under an open access license here. And again, there are numerous um, arrangements that Wiley, our publisher, has with funders that may um, facilitate you publishing um, this way. The journal also features unique article formats such as Flora Obscura. Um, which is a really um, interesting series of articles focusing on um, unusual um, plant-focused research. 
And if you're interested, there's more details at plantsbeopleplanet.org. Um, so I realised that was a really whistle-stop tour of some of the activities of the New Phytologist Foundation, but you can also um, find out more information about the foundation and our journals at newphytologist.org. You can contact me at, at that email address um, on screen, um, and you, you can find my email address online as well. So I'm happy to answer any questions that, that you might have online and also later on in, in the session. Thanks so much, Sarah. Thanks so much. That's great. Nice whistle stop tour of the uh, New Phytologist Foundation. Okay, so next up, we're going to invite Mike to come and talk about uh, the X plot. There you go, Mike. Okay, how does that look? Looks good. Great. Just going to move that there. Right. Okay. Thanks, Geraint, for uh, inviting me to talk today. And I'm just going to give you a very brief intro of who JXB is and, and what we're about. Okay. If you want to contact us after the event, then the, the details are here and I'll provide them again at the end as well. So we've been going for uh, 70 years. The first edition was in March 1950. Um, so we've got quite a long history. The current editor in chief of JXB is John Lunn. So he is based at the Max Planck Institute uh, for Molecular Plant Physiology in uh, Potsdam in Germany. And he's been the editor in chief since, uh, well, for about a year now. And he took over from Christine Rains. Uh, but he was an editor with us uh, for a long time before that. Um, the journal is owned entirely by the Society for Experimental Biology, the SEB. Um, so all the profits um, from the journal get directed back to the SEB for them to, to do their, their outreach work and their community reinvestment. And I'll get onto that a bit, a bit later as well. Um, but also being owned 100% by a society um, really um, sort of influences our editorial policies and we try to be as inclusive as possible uh, wherever possible. We're published by Oxford University Press, but we also have a, uh, an independent editorial office based on the campus at Lancaster University with uh, five full time staff dedicated to the journal. So, you know, we, we pride ourselves on our customer service. We've got a team dedicated to, to serving the needs of our editors, authors, reviewers. Uh, every day of the week, so I think that's pretty pretty good. Um, let's see if I can change the slide. Right, um, so we've undergone a few changes recently, um, hopefully for the better. Uh, we're now online only, so as of the beginning of this year, we finally dragged ourselves into the 21st century, and we, as of the beginning of last year, we we've switched to a slightly different hybrid publishing model. So we used to have a very popular hybrid publishing model. Um, we've recently changed it, and the main reason behind that was to to allow as many people as possible still who wanted to submit to JXB to still be able to do so. So this involves um, getting more institutions into read and publish deals so that if they are Plan S funded, they have a route to publish in JXB still. We've undergone a big expansion of our editorial board um, in the last 12 months. Um, so we're now more likely to have an editor to handle a manuscript in a specific area. We've got a more diverse set of specialisms amongst our editorial board. And we've also used this opportunity to, to address what was previously quite an embarrassing lack of diversity in our editorial board. So hopefully it now reflects better the diversity of our community uh, of reviewers and authors, um, but there's still, still work to be done there, but it's something we're, we're looking at. And uh, as of the middle of last year, we've started accepting methods papers. So you can submit now a technical innovation, which is essentially a methods paper, um, which would be accompanied by an open access protocol uh, deposited on protocols.io. Or you can submit a community resource paper, which would describe something like a tool or resource or database uh, that's of, of fairly broad appeal. So we now accept those sorts of papers as well. I'm just going to briefly touch on submissions because um, I know it interests quite a lot of people. So we do try to be as flexible as possible when um, checking in new manuscripts, new submissions. So we have a few basic requirements and they're purely there just to help the referees and editors assess, assess a manuscript. So they are that the manuscript must have line numbering, figures have to be legible and the English is sufficient that people can understand what's in the manuscript. If that's if they're all ticked, then we'll check your manuscript in and it will go to the go to go, at least go to the editor. 
Um, so we try to be as flexible as possible with the formatting. We also have embraced um, BioArchive. So for some time now, we've been fully integrated with BioArchive. So authors can transfer manuscripts um, from that preprint server to the journal um, at the click of a button. So no need to re-enter all your metadata. And you can also submit to BioArchive uh, at the same time you submit to JXP. So now I'm going to touch briefly on some of the community activities that the work of the journal helps fund. So as I said, all of our profits go back to the SEB and they are reinvested in the community. So they use these, this money to do things like uh, put on a big annual conference, put on lots of other symposia, um, workshops. Um, they've recently been doing a lot of training, online training opportunities for ECRs things like that. Um, in normal times, they'd be giving out a lot of travel grants for people to go to conferences or visit other labs. And they also do quite a bit of outreach work as well. Um, so that's where all our profit goes. Coming soon, we're going to kick off, uh, well, in a very minor way, a JXB webinar series. So these will be where recent authors of the journal, uh, in the journal, will present sort of a, a brief overview of their paper. And um, we're going to kick that off in March with, uh, I think, Eric Murchie talking about canopy photosynthesis and uh, Diane Basson from the States talking about TOR signaling. So there's a couple of exciting webinars coming your way. Um, the editorial staff in Lancaster can also help you promote your paper. So we encourage um, especially ECRs to get involved with um, things like our first author videos where we'll ask you to record a little one minute, two minute video on your phone, just giving a brief overview of your paper. And we can help you um, jazz that up a bit with infographics and, and figures and stuff and get that on social media. And that helps not only to promote your paper, but also for ECRs to help promote themselves as well. Um, additional benefits for society members. So we offer discounted publication charges where, where they apply. And this is not just the case for SEB members, but for members of other affiliated societies, such as the FBSBB, with whom uh, the journal is affiliated. And we also, look to support ECRs in other ways so we try and get them uh, enable them to have opportunities to get involved in peer review as much as possible and where they do um, get involved with that we try and credit them through things like publons and uh, in the near future we're going to be kicking off um, some junior editorships um, which we've been planning to do for a while but has been somewhat delayed due to the due to the current situation Lastly, I just want to talk about special issues um, because this is quite an integral part of what JXB does. So every year we aim to publish 10 special issues. So these are themed issues. They're often linked to a scientific meeting, but they don't have to be. Um, and what we normally do is ask the organisers of the meeting to act as guest editors and help us secure some authoritative reviews to, to form the core of the issue. And then we open up submissions around that. And in return for that, we can offer quite a substantial amount of financial sponsorship for your meeting, whether it be in person or, or virtual. Um, and they prove fairly successful and fairly popular. Um, and there's just a few examples uh, given there. So if anyone's interested in, in kickstarting a special issue, just let us know. And I think that's me done. So yeah, please contact me if you have any, any questions about anything or if you don't get time to ask your question at the end. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Actually, if you go back a slide, I can. I've got to say say something about the special issue. Special issue. So this this one here, the one second in from the left, um, with the kind of nucleus in it. You see that one there, Mike? Can you point mm -hmm. over it? This um, one here. So yeah, I was so I was involved with the editorial of that, and I have a lot of paper copies of this uh, uh. This, this special issue at my house. So if anyone wants one of these. Um, write to me and we can figure out a way that I can I can send it on to you so so I have yeah quite quite a few of these so it's a great great collection of articles and if you're interested in kind of chromatin biology please let me know and I'll and I can find a way to send that to you I'm sure we can work something out but uh, anyway sorry just to flag that up because uh, my partner's getting kind of annoyed with it hanging around anyway okay so enough of my life there thanks very much Mike and um, we'll come back to you for questions in a minute and um, we're going to bring in Mary now hey Mary Okay, make the presenter. Here we go. Super. Thank you. Um, I think that bits of my uh, presentation have been uh, covered by someone else already. <laughs> um, so one editorial comment I'll make. Uh oh, what happened? Do you see my screen? 
Not anymore. No, now, now I do. It's back again. Yeah. Okay, that was a bit weird. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Um. Uh. We're all sort of saying how we're different from each other, but we're actually very similar in one way, and that we're all representing plant journals. And I think that um. We would all argue that if you are publishing a paper about plant science, you're probably going to get more plant scientists reading it if it's in a plant journal. So we're all saying, oh, we're slightly different in this way or that way. But um, I would definitely recommend that you strongly consider a plant focused journal for your work, um, because I think you're going to find your readers in these journals that you're hearing about today. Um, my name is Mary Williams, and uh, I tweet a lot as Plant Teaching, that's with two Ts, and you can reach me at mwilliams at aspb.org. And I'm here to represent the American Society of Plant Biologists. This is a, was founded initially nearly 100 years ago as a professional society for plant biologists. And uh, you may know that it was originally the American Society of Plant Physiologists, but about 20 something years ago, it renamed itself as Plant Biologists to represent the, the broadening of the interests of the members. Um, and as, as a professional society, it became clear that having a journal to publish the work in of the members was important. So Plant Physiology, the journal, launched shortly after the American Society for Plant Biologists was founded. Um, we also publish The Plant Cell, and we co-publish Plant Direct. Um, we do lots of things, just like uh, Mike was saying, that the um, Society for Experimental Biology does. We do meetings, we do workshops, we do lots of great things. So again, if you're not already a member of a professional society at any career level, we strongly encourage you to consider that, because the benefits are great. Yeah. Okay. Um, as Mike mentioned also, um, as a professional society, um, there's a sort of synergistic relationship between the society and the journals in that members of ASPB get quite steep discounts on publication in the journals. Um, so again, if you're considering publishing in any of the journals, have a look and see. You'll probably more than recoup your membership if you join as a member to publish. And then, of course, the revenue that comes from the journals, um, most of the revenue covers the costs associated with publishing the journals, but there's always a bit extra. And that directly supports the interests of the society, which includes uh, travel awards, research fellowships, workshops, all sorts of things. So a strong plug for supporting not only professional societies, but, but journals published by professional societies, because you're essentially paying in your own interests. You're paying yourself. For the great things that that the societies will offer you. Um, so that's one of my uh, my key messages is that these journals, Plant Cell, Plant Fizz, and Plant Direct, directly supports the community. Um, one of the another example I got involved in ASPB to develop the teaching tools in plant biology, and this was an initiative to try and think of how can we best serve the community. And pretty much everything we do at ASPB is is with that in mind. What can we do to support the plant science community? Um, again, our three journals, you can see that Plant Biz was founded in 1926, Plant Cell in 89, and then Plant Direct, which we co-publish with the Society for Experimental Biology in 2017. One piece of news is that each of our three, uh, each of Plant Biz and Plant Cell, we've recently initiated a partnership with them with Oxford University Press. So if you go to the website that you've known and loved for decades, um, you'll see that it will redirect you now to the OUP websites. So I'll just flag those up. And the uh, first issue in this new partnership should be up, but it's not quite done. So it'll be up hopefully this week. Um, so we look forward to seeing how those look. Um, uh, if you have any interest in going, uh, questions beyond these individual journal uh, overviews, please visit the websites. Um, another point I wanted to make is that um, all of the editors on the each of the journals are practicing plant scientists. So the people, we have very large editorial boards because everybody's very busy. So um, you know, each editor will handle the papers that are in their own specialty, at, in addition to their regular job being a, a scientist and a PI. We have a lot of different interesting programs. A few years ago, we started the Assistant Features Editors Program, and this is uh, the, the current new group of Plant Fizz Assistant Features Editors. It's a fantastic program, and we will 
at the end of each calendar year, we announce another call for um, applicants. I think it's a great deal of fun, and the assistant features editors are members of the editorial board, and they get to write paper highlights for the journals. Um, another thing, again, what can we do for this the, um, the, the community? Well, the PI or the senior author often gets all the glory and gets invited to conferences and things, but we know that the first author tends to be the one who does most of the work for any given paper. So we celebrate the first authors by publishing a first author profile. It's very popular and um, it's a lot of fun for us to have a chance to, to sort of shine the, the spotlight on the, the people who actually did the work as opposed to the ones who just got the funding. Um, we also have focus issues. Plant Fizz has had maybe six or so focus issues a year for quite some time now. And Plant Cell is just beginning to, to re, um, revisit this. It's a did it for a while, stopped, and now we're starting again. So in April of this year, we'll have a, a focus issue on plant genomes in the plant cell. And then um, the next one will be April of 20. Wait, anyway, I probably got my dates wrong. <laughs> but check the website. Uh, we've got a focus issue in cell biology with the application deadline of May 1st. And I'm helping to coordinate that. Um, as far as money goes, I mentioned that um, we have uh, discounts for members. I want to also mention that Plant Direct is an open access journal. Um, we can get CC BY licenses, so um, Creative Commons licenses for your publications in Plant Cell and Plant Biz. And again, because of some of this is brand new, uh, partnering with OUP, I would recommend that you go to the OUP website, which has lots of information about these so-called um, uh, partnerships. They're sometimes called uh, transformative partnerships or transformative agreements where the publisher partners with, for example, an institution which provides open access fees for the authors. So it's kind of a newish thing in publishing and um, it's, it's something that you might want to read up about. And I think that might be my last slide. Yep, that's it for me. Okay, thanks Mary. Okay, so last but by no means least, let me invite Chris forward. Okay, Chris, let me share your screen now. And please, just before I go, um, let me encourage everyone to now start to put questions into the into the question box, and then I will put that to our to our speakers after after Chris has talked. So, thanks very much, Chris. Good. Okay, can you hear me and see the screen? Yeah, yes, it's good. Good. Okay. Well, I, I mean, so I'm, I'm Chris Surridge. Uh, I'm chief editor of uh, Nature Plants, and I'm feeling um, slightly overawed by the by being in this company because um, I'm by far the youngest journal, uh, the smallest journal, uh, and um, the the journal with the, possibly the least um, uh, the least additional activities that that go on around it. Uh, and so, um, uh, but. I think one of the things that you will uh, know, have worked out by now is, although we are all plant journals, uh, not all plant journals are the same, uh, and we um, uh, tend to, to look at, at different things and have have different priorities um, and different ways of doing things. Uh, and you've had a range of them so far. So, um, in many ways, Nature Plants we launched um, six years ago, uh, six years ago now, uh, on a very a uh, traditional model, really, of, of publishing in, in the um, uh, the way that the uh, nature journals uh, have been publishing for for many long years. Um, and um, what are the things that are worth mentioning about it? Well, I mean, uh, as you say, Nathan was talking about how the the um, Frontiers is the largest journal. We're definitely the smallest uh, in that uh, we publish 120, 130. Uh, research articles a year, which is not many. You can do the, the maths, it's between 10 and 11 a month. Uh, and what we attempt to do is we are attempting to um, select uh, the, um, hopefully the most uh, significant uh, work that's done, which is either on plants or highly related to, to plant biology uh, in, the, in that month, at that time. Uh, and so that's what we are really concentrating on. You've heard a lot about from everyone else talking about their um, uh, their editorial boards, uh, and um, uh, I have no editorial board. Uh, what the the way that Nature Plants runs is it runs with 
let me count them on my fingers. Uh, I think that's four, maybe five, depends how you count it, uh, professional editors, uh, which are people like me. Um, uh, we, we do know something about plant biology, uh, and um, certainly all of my colleagues have been, um, most of my colleagues have been, have done uh, active research in, in plant biology, in the plant biology field. Uh, and um, we think that uh, not having an editorial board uh, has some advantages. Uh, some of those advantages is we do this every day. Uh, this is all we do. You know, all we do is to worry about people's research and uh, worrying about managing its peer review uh, and worrying about its publication. Uh, rather than being distracted by things like having to do our own research, you know, applying for our own grants, worrying things like that. Uh, we also think that by having a, um, uh, uh, by not being practicing scientists at this time, although as I say, we all have been in the past, uh, it gives us an ability to be slightly more open-minded about what we um, what we think could be important, possibly a little bit faster on our feet to um, uh, change our minds and um, and look at a. Uh, 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 at new and spot new trends and spot new uh, arising subject areas. Um, uh, and um, of course this would mean, and um, then we run a fairly standard peer review system, which means uh, if we decide to, uh, that we think the paper is going to be appropriate for us, we'll send it out to three, uh, three referees. Uh, and um, because we don't have an editorial board, which I've already said, and I will stop saying that soon, I promise, uh, we can use just about any researcher in the um, in the world, we can invite to referee our papers, uh, and so we try and find the most uh, the most appropriate three people, normally three, uh, to um uh, to look at that specific piece of uh, to look at that specific piece of work. Um, what else is is it worth talking about? Um, yeah, we don't we don't do special uh, we do we just we just concentrate on publishing the um. What we consider to be the most significant work, we do have a do highlight that with some front half materials. We do we publish news and views, which are basically commentaries on on some of the research that we publish and also research that other people publish. Uh, we do publish reviews. We do publish shorter reviews that we tend to call progresses. Um, we do also publish some comment pieces and things. Where I don't think we are small though uh, is in our in the breadth of our interests. Uh, so we really do try and look at the entirety of plant biology and everything that's uh, that is uh, is going to be of all the research that's going to be of interest to plant biologists. So, like uh, we um you know our core our core research areas are mo molecular and cellular biology uh, and genetics, and we've been and but we will uh, go across the whole scale of plant biology. So. Uh, we will publish uh, and are interested in papers that are looking at the atomic level, which tends to be involve uh, structural biology and sort of, uh, and photosynthesis, right down at the um, atomic and sometimes with photosynthesis subatomic part at um, scale. And then we'll take it all the way up uh, through um, uh, through the molecular and cellular biology, through the plant physiology. We'll look at ecology. We will look at um, uh, agroecology as well and agricultural systems and, and relevance there uh, and we will move up to having whole whole global uh, a, a global oversight uh, with um, you know plenty of uh, plenty of global scale ecology plenty of when we can get it when it's good uh, and also we've uh, we have an interest uh, in the way that um, uh, plants people planet I never get those three in the right way has a look at the um the interface between um, humanity and plants, we also have an interest in there. So we will we will look at things that we will broadly call sociology, I guess. Um, and um, we'll do some archaeobotany, uh, so archaeology. So we take we, we run the whole gamut. Uh, so it's uh, so that's where um, that's why I have some uh, have some breadth. Um, right at the moment, well, up until about two weeks ago, uh, we were a, a journal that was purely a, a subscription only journal. Uh, and, and that it was, um, we were entirely free to, to authors uh, and um, to read our content uh, required a subscription, although there is always a way. We have a way, there are always ways that you can read our content without having subscriptions. Normally, in a, we have a, a we have the uh, um, read-only PDF versions of, um, uh, of papers, which um, uh, authors tweet out links to. We often tweet the links out to, um, tweeting is, uh, a good way of finding papers. So um, yeah, up until two weeks ago, we were we were like that. Um, and um, then at the beginning of this year, 
uh, in common with all the um, the, the uh, nature research journals, we have uh, moved into what we're calling a transformative journals. Uh, Mary talked about transformative agreements, which are uh, uh, which are ways to um, uh, deal with um, author pays fees uh, for for open access. Uh, it's going to take a while before um, uh, the the whole of the um, uh, research. Uh, literature is going to be able to be published open access and a lot of that is to do with very boring things about money and the way that um, uh, financing research is structured. So it's going to take a little while but um, uh, to go fully open access for everybody. Um, but these transformative, these, that's why we're calling ourselves a transformative journal is because we are pushing to be, to hope to be publishing more and more open access content uh, over the, over the coming years. And we're not saying how many years because we'll see how it goes. Um, but it's good. Uh, but as I say, as Mary mentioned, transformative agreements. Uh, at the moment, we have transformative agreements. Uh, I think we've only got two at the moment, but um, they're quite significant. One of them is with Max Planck uh, in Germany, which means all Max Planck authors uh, can can publish away with us with no cost to them because Max Planck covers it. And uh, another one with the University of California. So. Um, We'll see how that progresses. We hope it progresses quickly, uh, but we are committed to ensuring that uh, no one will ever be able, uh, well, no one will be prohibited from publishing uh, at Nature Plants uh, because of any ability to, any ability or inability to pay. Um, other than that, what else did I want to say? What else did I want to say about anything? I think that's probably, I think that's probably enough because by now you've listened to the five of us talk uh, and um, I suspect that we will have much more interesting que answers to questions than anything that we can dream up off the top of our heads. Um, you can easily find my email address, it's on the, it's on the website. Thank you. Great, thanks so much Chris, thanks so much. Okay, so um, let me invite the other speakers to, to come back up. Um, let me... Hey everyone, let me take back the screen. Okay. Okay. So um, yeah, I encourage anyone to to ask any questions you have. So um, the first one we come in inevitably about cost. So um, someone, um, so Lawrence uh, Binshelder has given a talk. So one issue is quite right in in these. These, this is this, this era of open open access. Oftentimes, the prices can be more expensive, um, especially for small groups with that have smaller grants. Um, can you outline how you can, you know, what your journals do to help people get around this if there are issues with with um, getting the costs required? So, um, Chris, do you want to kick off with that? If you if you want to, <laughs> if you've got an answer, yeah. uh, have I got an answer for it? Well, on the one hand, is that you don't ha we don't have to, you don't have to take up uh, the open access options, uh, and you can t you know we aren't changing uh, what we have been doing for the last six years, uh, which is you know you you come to us we will publish your paper it has absolutely no cost we don't charge uh, we won't charge you um uh, uh, color figure charges word counts anything like that there is no cost to authors uh, if you are happy uh, for us to uh, to publish the paper and have it under uh, have it on yeah have it for uh, under embargo for six months uh, before releasing onto a um uh onto a um an open an open an open access repository and we'll facilitate getting it into an open access repository as well uh we'll um we'll look after all the dep deposition to um uh PubMed uh PubMed central for you i think that's the right one um uh, and we have no problems with you putting your your paper before you um, send it to us onto a um, onto a preprint server. That has absolutely no effect on the way you, that we look at it. And again, they also said, if you are an author of one of, one of our papers, we will supply you with a, a link that you can share with anyone, which will take them to uh, a a freely a free to read version of your paper. Um, so you know those are those are ways we're working on, and we are. You know the whole of the company, Nature Public Nature Springer Nature. Sorry, get me get my names right. It's a long time since we actually merged, but I still can't get it remember it. Springer Nature itself is is working very hard with funders and organisations to find ways to to fund open access. 
uh, in the future. And that's that's how it uh, that's how it is. So you can publish with as fine. We'll find ways that, you, that everybody you need to can read the read the work. But yeah, open access costs I money. Would, yeah. So I mean, I would say on on that point that you know, in my experience with with Chris, that if I've ever needed to access a paper, then you've been very good sharing the the um, uh, uh, the down, the PDF and the online PDF uh, version. So I'm sure people ask, and you might be able to do some papers there. But uh, it's not for me to say. Um, so um, anyone else want to take that? Who else wants to consider that about uh, um, helping people with charges? Anyone else? Wanna... Well, um, just briefly. I mean, I mentioned that you get substantial discounts for membership, um, and uh, if you choose not to use the open access thing, or you don't have a transformative agreement, um, like I think Mike or Sarah mentioned, things become available freely after a year. Um, so you know, you lose a little bit of that first year. Um, the truth is that there are real costs associated with taking a manuscript from a preprint into something that lives permanently on a server that's discoverable, that has quite high quality images, where the references are cross-linked. I mean, if somebody doesn't want to pay, then then make it a preprint, right? I mean, because there's no reason you can't do that. And you can make it a preprint and then later make it into a publication. But if you want your journal published, just like if I want my book published, you know, somebody has to to, to, to put some work into it. <laughs> Um, if, for example, you are very, 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 very disadvantaged, and most laboratories aren't, right? I mean, most laboratories have grants, but if you, for example, are really very, very disadvantaged, you can ask to have fees waived. But, you know, you have to make a pretty strong case to, to, to get all your fees waived, otherwise <laughs> everybody would ask. Well, it's good, it's good to know there's that option there, for sure. Oh, yeah. Sarah, do you want to... Yeah, I can just add to that. that um... For certain countries where there, um, so, um, where there may not be as well-funded labs, there are arrangements where there are automatic waivers for certain um, author groups from certain um, countries. So that's another option as well. And if ever you're not sure if, if you these discounts or waivers apply to you, then you can always look on the journal websites or contact editorial offices, and they'll certainly be able to put you in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can add something here. Yeah, um, yeah, like absolutely, like Mary said, there's there are costs associated with publishing, but from the big right from the beginning, as Frontier's uh, philosophy has been, is that those costs shouldn't come from the readers, and we believe that we're trying to reduce these costs as much as possible, while ensuring that the manuscripts can be read as widely as possible. Now, similarly to what Mary, Sarah said, um, I think, and Chris as well, we have various schemes for ensuring that authors um, can pay the publishing charges and actually we look at this in a in a two different ways we have the institutional agreements like for example with JISC in the UK which means that a very large uh, majority of the universities in the UK can publish with us either a very reduced cost or a complete waiving of the fee or in many of the other um, less um, in situations in which the actual researchers can't afford the charges, then we have a scheme in which they can tell us about their funding situation. And that means that we go through every application um, to assess what would be a fair cost associated for them. And what's great actually of these institutional agreements is that it means that if the research is being funded properly for open access, it means that we can use some of these fees to then assure that those who can't afford the fees can also um, are able to publish their work as, as easily as possible and as widely as possible. So we really feel like we've struck the right direction with this. And if there's ever any difficulty paying uh, article processing charges, Frontiers and Frontiers and Plant Science is more than happy to discuss these with any authors. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mike, do you want to add anything to this? I mean, I know it's... Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd echo what everyone's already mentioned, but I'd probably emphasize, um, I guess, what Mary and Sarah would probably also emphasize is that, you know, join your, join your society. You know, it's, it's a nominal fee to join compared to the benefit you get back, not only in discounted uh, publication fees, but, you know, some of the work that Sarah, Mary and myself have talked about is other stuff we do, other stuff our societies do to put back into the community. So that's where your money is going. So I'd encourage people to join their society, or whichever one their home one is. Absolutely. So um, we have a question from Isabel Mendoza, who 
uh, Mary and I know well. Um, so uh, Isabel asks about preprints. So a number of you mentioned it, Mike specifically mentioned about BioArchive, but um, have you got any particular opinions on preprints and the relationship between your journals and, and, and preprint servers? Are you all happy to interact with those, those uh, servers to, to do that? For them to submit first and then, Nathan, do you wanna take that? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, like I can't remember, um, Mary said, that we have integration with BioArchive to ensure that those manuscripts can easily be passed over to Frontiers. And so, yeah, we absolutely love uh, preprints and we've got, we would encourage anyone who wants to publish with them or publish, post their work with them first to do so. Okay, cool. Uh, any other comments on, on preprints? Do you have a relationship with, um, you're, you're fine with preprints at Nature Plants, Chris, I'm guessing? That, yeah, completely. Uh, okay. Complete, uh, completely. I mean, our, 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 what we, we, we basically pretend they don't exist uh for the purposes of uh, of looking at it uh so uh if you if things are posted on a preprint before before they're submitted to us uh that doesn't mean that we would reject them or, or take them any other way um and equally if things are published on a or, that are present on a preprint server which would say scoop uh of any work that, that that we have under consideration that also doesn't count uh so we we, we basically for the purposes of uh selection and review uh, we ignore preprint servers completely. That seems to be the easiest way. When I say we ignore them, it doesn't mean that we haven't got alerts running on them to find out what's going up there. But yeah, you are we, aware. We, you are aware of them. we are we are aware of those, and every now and again, and occasionally, since um, uh, my colleague Guillaume is is quite a, an avid user of Twitter, he he runs most of our Twitter feed. Uh, he will right. often comment on papers that are in the preprint servers. Uh, in, in BioArchive, for example, and it's surprising how often we suddenly find a um, submission from of that work to us, uh, which was not our intention. That's not what we were planning on. We just thought it was good work, but um, that often happens. But so yeah, absolutely no problem. I would recommend that if you're if you're an early career person and you can put your work on a preprint, you do it. I know that some PIs don't let you, um, but maybe that's something to think about when you're looking at your next lab position. What is the PI's position on preprints? And does it mesh with what you have in mind for your career? Absolutely. Okay, so let me um, let me ask a question about the relationship between journals and journals within the same kind of um, uh, stable, if you will. So particularly between you know JXBOT and ASB, maybe you can talk about the the movement of journals amongst um, between. Uh, sorry, the movement of papers among, between journals. So, what sort of relations do you do each of you have with different um, journals? So, Grant, I think you understand the question I'm trying to make here. So, is it, for example, Mary, the movement between Plant Direct and Plant Fizz and different things like this? Do you want to kick off with that? Okay, so, so our three um, Plant Cell, Plant Fizz, Plant Direct, you can move between them seamlessly. Plant Direct is a recipient of papers from Plant Fizz, Plant Direct, I'm sorry, Plant Fizz, Plant Cell, and Plant Journal, and I think Plant JX Spot at some point, yeah? Okay, I don't know if it's current or it's imminent or, but yeah, so so it, it's sort of catching things. Um, you know, obviously we know that things move between JX Spot and Plant Fizz, but it doesn't happen through a, you know, a pipeline. <laughs> so we'll, <laughs> We talk to each other and we know these things happen, but we don't have these conduits that are sort of whizzing papers back and forth between the stables, as you say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, any other comments? So, well, Sarah, what about the relationship between New Fight and, and PPP? Are they, is that possible? Yeah, so we, we do occasionally um, advise an author who's submitted to New Phytologist that their work would be suitable for PPP, Plants People Planet. Um, but because the, the scope is quite different and for publication in Plants People Plant, we'd expect to see that societal um, element, not all submissions are, are suitable. So there is a, a fairly straightforward transfer process for between those two journals. It's easy for us because we are we're you know we're both owned by the New Phytologist Foundation. We share the same editorial office. There's similarities in editorial staff. Editorial office staff rather. So that's a really, really easy um, tra transfer option. And if you're Papers rejected at your pathologist, and you're not given the option to 
transfer to Plant Through Planet, but you'd like to, you can always drop us a note and we, we can help facilitate that as well. Okay. We did, a, yeah, back in the pre-pandemic days, we had quite close connection to G-Export because we were next door neighbours to them, but um, that was a, a different type of relationship. So. <laughs> like a long time ago now. <laughs> yeah. So Nathan, uh, can you give an insight about how things work at Frontiers? So obviously there's lots of Frontiers titles. Do you choose the one which is maybe, if, if it's not best for a particular paper, you might, or are you all competitive between different uh, Frontiers titles? You know? No, um, we're definitely not competitive with the other Frontiers titles. But so say a manuscript comes to Frontiers in plant science first, and we um, we have an initial look at it, and we send it to one of our editor editors on the board. Um, and for example, if they really feel like it's not going to be suitable, or the chief editor of that um, section feels it's not suitable and within the scope of that particular section, they may recommend that it's transferred to one of our um, other journals, um, in which case it's very simple. Um, but generally we try and keep all of the um, plant science, uh, obviously focused uh, manuscripts within Frontiers in Plant Science because we have 19 sections, which covers a wide range from well, just the uh, technical advances, um, to plant physiology, to whatever you want. So we really cover the broad spectrum. Yeah, and Chris, maybe you can answer that in a similar way across the, yeah, the nature I mean, state. It's very, it, it's very similar. I mean, all of the, uh, all of the nature, I mean, all of the nature journals run on the same back end uh, manuscript handling systems, which makes moving transferring manuscript very easy. Uh, if we think a paper might be suitable, isn't suitable for us, but it might be suitable for another journal, you know, for example, Nature Communications or Communications Biology, we will sometimes have a, a initiate a consultation with those editors so that before we even send a, a decision to the authors, we can say, you know, it's not for us, but Nature Communications, it would be interested in refereeing the paper. Um, less commonly, though, I mean, it's still less commonly because it just doesn't happen but as, as often. If a paper is being reviewed, um, and so there are referees reports. Uh, those can be transferred over to the other journal when we transfer, and I'm sure that happens. I'm sure Mary's uh, or, or, that happens with plant fairs and, and ASV. So yeah, we we have easily movable move around. Only if the authors are happy for that to happen. If you aren't don't want any of that, those sorts of consult, consultations, um, then we don't do them. Uh, and equally, it's always in the author's hands as to whether the manuscript gets transferred or not. It's all down to the authors. And these days we've got lots of um, other journals because this is a much more of a sort of spring of nature section of spring of nature so uh we try we can transfer to places like um uh uh bmc bio, uh, bmc biology uh genome research horticultural research so we have uh, we also have those collected i said icmj is that the right journal um yeah those so they're all part of this so we we have that ease of of, of transfer around those some of those would will be less happy about sending reviews point um, yeah anyway okay. but yeah in, in general, we can transfer and we can transfer referees reports as well and so if, oh, sorry sorry Chris go on uh, no I was about to say something that I'm not sure is true so I won't say it <laughs> fair enough uh, Mike have you got a comment I've got a question for you but if you've got a comment on, on that I mean, I'll just echo what Mary said and that you know we we are starting an arrangement with Plant Direct now that's gone through a, a testing phase so we've actually transferred a few, manu a few manuscripts already and that's been successful um, so we'll look to announce that sort of formally uh, in the journal pretty soon um, we'll, we'll transfer decision letters reviewer reports all anonymized in terms of the reviewer reports obviously but they, everything will be transferred from us to plant direct for their consideration okay just a, a, a kind of question about a linkage mike for you so you know mary and, and sarah have kind of described the um the relationship they have with the different journals so if, if anyone knows anything about the seb that they know they also own um part of plant journal and also plant by technology journal but you don't you don't have relationship with those journals like you pub, published by someone different right is that right yeah so about? they're published by a different publisher so and they use different manuscript handling systems so we're quite distinct from them and we don't there's no official transfer agreements between them yeah that's okay. right and that's not so there's no there's been no conversations about that not yet <laughs> Okay. Oh, what's it say? Fair okay. Right. So um, 
let me have a look if you have any other questions. Uh, so I, I think that's all for the questions now. So someone just asked if the, the JXBot webinars will be free, Mike, I assume they will be. I also assume they will be. That is down to, so they will be managed and run by the SCB uh, events team. So I can find that out. But yeah, well, the last that's, that's we, had, we, we, we did have a webinar um, few, well, just before Christmas uh, and that was free and that was a JXB special issue webinar. So I'm, I'd, I'd encourage them to be free, yes. Let's announce here that it will be, that'll be all right. Okay, so, there you go. <laughs> all right, so that's great. So thanks for, for everyone who's, who's um, uh, who's been on the call? Oh, Chris, you want to add something? Sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say before we do close, I do. I, I'd like to. I mean, I'm not associated with a with a society, but I can definitely um, uh, echo what what Mary and Sarah has said. Has said it's well worth supporting your uh, your your societies. In mm -hmm. fact, I think myself and all of the editors at Nature Plants are in fact members of the ASPB. Um, but um, or at least we were at least, at least we were a year ago. We probably forgot. That, in lockdown, we'd probably let them lapse, but we will join again. Okay, so I think we're yeah, I think we'll end there. If anyone has anyone got any final comments they'd like to make or anything, Nathan, go on. yeah, um, maybe I'll put in as well. So yeah, I think echoing what Chris said is that we've all probably, as plant science researchers, benefited from what the societies have done, and it's actually something that uh, Frontiers is looking to do in the future is that to use our well-developed platform now is to support those societies that are out there. So for example, if there is a plant society that would like to partnership with Frontiers, we'd be very happy to hear about it because we have very um, well-developed platforms now which can facilitate the transition to open access in particular um, and make it the perfect home for certain societies. So mm -hmm. we'd be very happy to hear about that. Good to know. Excellent. Okay, great. All right, then, uh, thanks so, for you. Can I, can I, can I, sorry, can I say one more thing? Of course you can. To, to anybody who is still watching this, you now yeah. have got the, the fact that you are now looking at um, five editors and Geraint. Uh, so you know that we actually look like normal people, uh, do not have horns, do not have tails. Um, and, you know, we're happy to answer questions. It's always worth, if you have any questions, any doubts about your work, any doubts about about what, whether it's appropriate for journals, any questions that, that might come up. The easiest thing, the way to find an answer to them is get is email the editor of whatever journal you're interested in. We're in general really friendly people and we will give you all the advice we can because our job is, the job of an editor is to help you publish your papers. Uh, and um, you know, above all, that's that's what we do. That's what all of us do. And therefore you really, you know, don't be scared of us. Get in contact. That's true. I think we can all agree with that. That's great. Okay, so thanks so much, everyone. It has been very interesting. We've got some nice, nice comments in the questions saying that thanks, thanking you for uh, for your contribution. So um, I will uh, edit this and I'll actually put it up online so anyone can catch up with it afterwards, if that's all right with everyone. Um, and uh, so thanks very much for everyone for for coming and uh, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks for the next webinar. Thanks very much. Thank you. Nice Brilliant. to see everybody. Thank you, Gary. Bye. 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 Bye.